What's up, everybody? Today we'll be talking about why the periodic table has the funky looking shape that it has. By now you probably know that the elements in the periodic table are arranged such that atomic number increases from left to right across a period or row of the periodic table, and that these rows are stacked on top of one another such that elements with similar chemical properties appear in the same group, family, or vertical column of the periodic table. What you may not know, however, is why these chemical properties reappear in this periodic fashion whenever we arrange the elements in order of increasing atomic number. Enter the explanatory power of the quantum mechanical model of the atom. Now we're not going to discuss this topic entirely in this video alone, but in this video we're going to discuss some of the basics behind the periodic properties of the elements, and then in the next video we're going to bring all of that knowledge together. Now if you don't know much about the quantum mechanical model of the atom, I highly recommend that you check out my quantum mechanical model of the atom playlist, specifically my video on orbitals and quantum numbers, and also my video on the shapes of atomic orbitals, and that'll get you where you need to be uh, in terms of understanding the content of this video. Some elements have similar chemical properties because they have similar electron configurations, which shows which orbitals are occupied for a given element. The electron configurations that we're going to discuss in the next few videos are called ground state electron configurations. The term ground state means that the electrons have the lowest possible energies. This is the ground state electron configuration for a hydrogen atom. The 1s refers to the 1s orbital, and the 1 superscript indicates the number of electrons that reside in hydrogen's 1s orbital, which is obviously one electron. Now the orbitals of all of the elements other than hydrogen are not exactly the same as hydrogen's orbitals because the electrons in these multi-electron atoms, as they're called, interact with one another. But computational chemists have determined that these orbitals in multi-electron atoms are essentially hydrogen-like but with two important exceptions, which are the concepts of electron spin and sublevel energy splitting. Electron spin was first shown empirically in 1922 by the stern gerlach experiment, in which a beam of silver atoms is split into two separate paths by a magnet. The spin of an electron creates a tiny magnetic field that interacts with the external magnetic field. One spin orientation deflects the beam in one direction, and the other spin orientation deflects the beam in the opposite direction. This experiment, along with a few others, showed that electron spin is a basic property of all electrons, and that all electrons have the same amount of spin. There are no electrons that have any more or less spin than others. It also showed that electron spin is quantized, with only two possibilities that we call spin up and spin down. Electron spin can be shown by representing hydrogen's electron configuration using an orbital diagram, in which the orbital is shown as a box, and the electrons are shown as half-headed arrows that point either up or down. We can specify electron spin by using a fourth quantum number called the spin quantum number, m sub s, which has two possible values, positive one-half and negative one-half. An m sub s value of positive one-half indicates an electron in the spin up state and is represented by the upward pointing arrow, and an m sub s value of negative one-half indicates an electron in the spin down state and is represented by the downward pointing arrow. Let's take a look at the ground state electron configuration of a helium atom. We've got two electrons chilling in helium's 1s orbital, but how do their spins orient relative to one another? Are they spinning in the same orientation or in opposite orientations? In 1925, Wolfgang Pauli answered this question in the form of the Pauli exclusion principle, which states that no two electrons in an atom can have the same four quantum numbers. If two electrons are in the same orbital, then they have the same principal quantum number, azimuthal quantum number, and magnetic quantum number. So it follows that those two electrons must have opposite values of the spin quantum number. One must be spin up and the other must be spin down. So this means that each orbital can hold only two electrons at the most, and that those two electrons must have opposite spin orientations. Thus, the orbital diagram for a helium atom shows the two arrows pointing in opposite directions, not in the same direction. Now let's move on to the other concept that we must invoke for multi-electron atoms, and that is sublevel energy splitting. You see, in a hydrogen atom, the energy of an orbital depends only on the principal quantum number, which means that all orbitals within a given principal shell are degenerate, which means that they all have the same energy. In a multi-electron atom, however, the orbitals within a given principal shell are not degenerate. 
In general, the energy of orbitals within a given principal shell increases as the azimuthal quantum number increases. In other words, within a given principal shell, the s orbital has a lower energy than the p orbitals, which have lower energies than the d orbitals, which have lower energies than the f orbitals. We can better understand this sublevel energy splitting by taking a look at the radial distribution functions for all orbitals within a given principal shell. If you don't know anything about the radial distribution function, check out my video on the shapes of atomic orbitals and that'll explain it. Remember, the radial distribution function shows the probability of finding the electron within a thin spherical shell at a distance r from the nucleus. Right now you're looking at the radial distribution functions for the 2s and 2p orbitals. The 1s radial distribution function is also shown for comparison. We can see here that an electron in a 2p orbital generally has a higher probability of being found closer to the nucleus than an electron in a 2s orbital. So we might begin to suspect that the 2p orbital is lower in energy than the 2s orbital, but this is actually not true at all. The 2s orbital is actually lower in energy than the 2p orbital, but only when the 1s orbital is occupied. When the 1s orbital is empty, the 2s and 2p orbitals are degenerate. They have the same energy. The energy splitting of sublevels within a given principal level is caused by repulsive forces between electrons, or electron-electron repulsions as they're often called. In a multi-electron atom, each individual electron experiences two main forces, the attractive force coming from the positively charged nucleus, and also repulsive forces caused by other negatively charged electrons. Electrons that are far away from the nucleus experience shielding from electrons closer to the nucleus, which means that those closer electrons basically insulate the far away electrons from the full attractive force of the nucleus. Let's explore the concept of shielding by considering a lithium ion, which has the electron configuration 1s2, same as helium. The lithium ion has three protons, which gives the nucleus a charge of 3 plus. The two electrons in the lithium ion feel the full attractive force of the nucleus, but what would happen if we were to introduce a third electron? Well, the third electron would feel the attractive force of the nucleus, but not as strongly as the two existing 1s electrons, because those two 1s electrons are shielding the outer electron, resulting in an effective nuclear charge of 1 plus, 3 plus from the nucleus and 2 minus from the other two electrons. Now, if the third electron were to somehow get closer to the nucleus than those two 1s electrons, then it would feel the full 3 plus charge of the nucleus. This phenomenon is called penetration. Let's take another look at the radial distribution functions for the 2s and 2p orbitals. Notice the bump near the nucleus for the 2s orbital. This bump tells us that there's a significant probability of finding an electron in a 2s orbital very close to the nucleus. Also notice that this area of probability penetrates into the 1s orbital. It gets into that space where shielding by those 1s electrons becomes less effective. On the other hand, the 2p orbital's radial distribution function mostly lies outside of the 1s orbital's radial distribution function. Therefore, almost all of the 2p orbital is shielded from the full nuclear charge by the 1s orbital. As a result, the 2s orbital is actually lower in energy than the 2p orbital because it is more stabilized by the nuclear charge due to its greater penetration into the 1s orbital. We can see similar results by taking a look at the radial distribution functions of the 3s, 3p, and 3d orbitals. The s orbitals penetrate more than the p orbitals, which penetrate more than the d orbitals. So to rank the orbitals in the third principal level from lowest to highest energy, it would be 3s, then 3p, and finally 3d. This figure shows the general energy ordering for orbitals in multi-electron atoms. Notice that because of penetration, the sublevels in each principal shell are not degenerate for multi-electron atoms. Also notice that in the fourth and fifth principal shells, penetration becomes so important that the 4s orbital is actually lower in energy than the 3d orbitals, and the 5s orbital is actually lower in energy than the 4d orbitals. Beyond the 4s orbitals, the difference in energy between each set of orbitals becomes so small that the relative energy ordering can actually vary among elements. These differences can result in anomalies in the ground state electron configurations of the transition metals and their ions, and we're going to explore these anomalies in the next video. So you might be thinking, dude, how am I going to memorize this super complicated energy ordering for all of these orbitals? Well, fear not, because there is a way to figure it out without memorizing it. It's called the diagonal rule, and it works like this. List each principal shell from lowest principal quantum number on the top to highest principal quantum number on the bottom while also listing orbitals from left to right in order of increasing energy. Then draw diagonal lines that point downward and to the left as such. 
Following these diagonal lines will give you the correct energy ordering for the orbitals from lowest to highest energy. Thus, from lowest to highest energy, we've got 1s, then 2s, then 2p, then 3s, then 3p, then 4s, then 3d, then 4p, then 5s, then 4d, then 5p, then 6s, and so on. That is all for now. In the next video, we're going to talk about how to write the electron configurations for all multi-electron atoms in the periodic table. So stay tuned. Thank you very much for watching and have a good one.